Um, well, this goes down to slide 32. These three slides, 30, 31, 32, they contain more information, specific information on how, on how the uh, the law report was finally realized and what was the intention behind it. Um, freedom of capital movements, which is realized, fully realized within the single market, political stability of Europe, okay, this, this has to be discussed, not fully realized, I mean, uh, this is obvious, especially after the crisis, there was not political stability in the EU, or during the crisis at least, and we will be discussing about the crisis, I guess, today. So, these three slides, you have more information about this process of the realization of the Delors plan. Now, if you go down to uh, slide 33, uh, this slide now contains actually information you already know, right? Especially budgets, budget uh, discipline, already discussed, a very detailed discussed already in this class in the last days. Um, all, and also discussed that this that, that the uh, the uh, stability and growth pact of the EU fully failed, right? You remember our discussion. Uh, yes. Is there a comment? Yes, exactly. You remember all of that. Well, uh, now uh, this is now the discussion about the pact. A very. You know, a more detailed discussion a bit about, although we already discussed about this, but anyway, you have now, as of slide 30, 34, as of slide 34, you have now a more detailed discussion about, uh, or some more information about the Stability and Growth Pact, okay? Which, again, this was, uh, you remember, this was launched, uh, this was not foreseen in this specific, uh, in this specific form by the Maastricht Treaty, but was launched actually in 1997 uh, by the Treaty of Amsterdam, right? Okay, you have some more information here about the Stability and Growth Pact, but failed just because uh, there was no uh, uh, effective monitoring regarding especially fiscal policies. And there was no punishment. So without punishment, no, no, uh, sometimes respect, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, uh, now, uh, in, on slide 35, on slide 35, you have some more information about the um, uh, ECB members and the uh, uh, system of central banks. A bit more information. Not that detailed, but anyway, you have some more information here. Actually, also already discussed. And now, finally, on slide 36, you have an overview about how the euro is spread as a currency across Europe. Okay, this is a good overview. This slide provides a good overview blue, deep blue color, uh, in deep blue color, you can see this, the, the member states that already adopted the euro. Uh, the latest development during the crisis, during the crisis, the Baltic states adopted the euro during the crisis, so this is significant. Although the euro was in crisis, there have been, they have, they, there have been countries interested fully interested, strongly interested to adopt the common currency. Um, and you can see, uh, so this is the blue is the euro area. Uh, currencies that uh, are pegged to the euro, so fixed uh, exchange rates, okay, Denmark and Bulgaria, and floating currency, okay, now Britain left, Floating currency, Sweden, Poland, Czech Republic, Romania, Hungary, Croatia. 
This actually the only countries, remaining countries, that didn't yet adopt the euro. Not because some of them, of course, because they are not in the position yet, they do not fulfill the criteria. Other other countries like Sweden, because they decided it's a political decision not to enter the euro yet. Uh, but the um, former president of the European Commission, Mr. Juncker, Jean-Claude Juncker, that just stepped down, uh, said that the plan is for all countries, that, that all countries of the EU will join the euro. This is the final, should be the final uh, step of uh, unification in the monetary union. Well, uh, now, Slide 37, free to move uh, the Schengen Treaty. Uh, I inserted this slide here because the Schengen movie, uh, treaty, excuse me, the Schengen Treaty, of course, has to do at first place with the free movement of people within the Union, right? But of course, it also has an economic impact because at the same, at the same time, uh, makes easier also the movement of products, not only of persons. So if there is a problem with the uh, Schengen Treaty, as it is the case now, because there was a question by Mohammed, by the way, yesterday night, I just answered him today because I was busy with booking. <laughs> I didn't have time yesterday night for uh, detailed answers or for answers. Anyway, I answered him that uh, because just now, Germany is closing the borders again, as it was the case 2015, because of migration, you remember? We'll be discussing about this. Uh, now closes the borders because of the virus uh, to all countries around Germany. Uh, border control again. Exactly, there's a comment. A comment, a comment. Yes, exactly, there was a comment by Mohammed. Uh, of course, and uh, by securing at the same time that this will not affect explicitly explaining that, it will, that this will not affect the movement of products, because this goes together. If there are border controls and the Schengen Treaty is abolished for a specific period of time, of course, you cannot abolish the Schengen Treaty once you have signed and ratified it, okay? Um, you can abolish it because of specific conditions within a short period of time, and this was the case also in 2015 because of migration, because of uncontrolled migration. Uh, and this is the case now. It started yesterday, just just yesterday, and this will be extended, by the way, borders, not only land borders, but also airports in terms of people coming via air into the country. This will also be uh, abolished, closed. I'm afraid. Until the end of the week, we will see. Perhaps that Germany will also let the, uh, the the biggest two airports in Germany open, namely Frankfurt and Munich. All others, or perhaps Düsseldorf, perhaps, uh, or Berlin also. These two, three, or four, but not more than or not more than that. I think everything will will close for a month. And you know, the, pro the problem is I can't go to, to Athens from here, from Cyprus. There are, there are some flights, very expensive in the meanwhile, uh, much less than it used to be the case, but uh, with, decreasing, with decreasing prices, with horror or horrible prices in the meanwhile, I can go to Athens, but what should I do in Athens? I mean, I will stay, just stay in the apartment together with my mother or my sister. Everything is closed. There's nobody outside. No bars, no restaurants, nothing, not, no cafes, everything's closed. So, I don't know. Anyway, now, guys, this is now what I told you in the beginning of the course, of the session today, not of the course, of the today's session. If you go, please, down to 38, number 38. Okay. This is uh, now a, a chapter about the optimum currency area. Well, let me explain you the following. First of all, if you go to the materials I gave you in the last semester on that course now, on economic integration, you will see 
books. You will find the books, a subfolder with books, and you will find also a subfolder with 12 different PowerPoint presentations. The main book, the main book on this course in Düsseldorf, as far as I know, from the lady that teaches the course in Düsseldorf, the main course book is the book you see on that slide, 38, uh, by uh, Baldwin and Wiplow's the, the Economics of European Integration. This is the basic book. It's a huge book of around 900 pages. And this is, you, you can find this book in the materials I gave you, okay? On the top of that, which is very helpful for your studies, at least in Düsseldorf, not for this course, uh, you will find in a, in a subfolder, as I told you, 12 different PowerPoint presentations. And these PowerPoint presentations um, are presentations from that book. And these are PowerPoint presentations prepared by the authors themselves, by Baldwin and Wiblos. So chapter by chapter, you will find all presentations chapter by chapter of that book in the subfolder with these 12 different PowerPoint presentations. I had to add here, and please, this is a secret among us, I downloaded these presentations, PowerPoint presentations, illegally sometime. Not me, a Turkish friend of mine, good in technical, uh, with technical uh, skills, found somewhere this, uh, in the internet, these uh, PowerPoint presentations, downloaded them, and this is why I provide you with this with these materials in order to facilitate to facilitate your uh, work uh, at least for the ones that will go to Düsseldorf in this course. Uh, I'm sure the lady that teaches the course in Düsseldorf does not have these presentations. I give you. Okay? So this is a secret among us. Okay? <laughs> well, uh, is somebody saying thank you? Yes, thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure, it is a pleasure. <laughs> no problem. Well, it is a pleasure. I found them, I, I give you them. I mean, this didn't cost me anything. Uh, now, this optimum currency area, what, what is, is this important? This is a very important subject, uh, chapter, by the way, in the course in Düsseldorf. Why is this part of this course? Why is this part of the discussion about the euro? The, the, the reason is very simple. There is, since the late 50s, if I'm right, is an older theory, it's not a new theory. Uh, since the uh, late 50s, there is a theory, economic theory. By the way, uh, as you well know, uh, economics is not natural science, right? You know that. Economics belongs to the social sciences. Economics is nothing else than theory. Okay, not because you see diagrams and all these things, you think that uh, economics is a natural science that 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 uh, describes natural uh, natural uh, rules. This is this is not the case. Okay, everything is based on theory. Economics is social science, like sociology. Okay, um, so there isn't there is a theory in economics, the optimum currency area theory that uh, which actually describes and it is of course developed since then very much actually describes what are actually the conditions to be fulfilled so that a common currency can function well. This is in very short terms what an optimum currency area theory is, okay? And this theory is very important because on the basis of this theory, we can evaluate if the euro fulfills the criteria described by the theory since then in terms of if the euro is in the position to be, let's say, a good currency, right? Uh, and the outcome of this evaluation, just in order to anticipate it, the outcome of this evaluation on the basis of the optimum currency area in terms of 
if the euro fulfills the criteria of this theory and is thus a good currency, the outcome is the euro, to a great extent, does not fulfill the criteria of this theory. So the euro does not fulfill the very criteria describing what are the conditions to be fulfilled in order that the currency can work well. Guys, this is at least this is at least what the theory says. The theory says the euro is not in the position, the architecture of the euro is not in the position to fulfill the criteria set by this theory uh, in terms of a common currency working well. This is what it is about. And we will be discussing a bit more about this, if it's about the... Uh, the economic crisis in the EU, the financial crisis, not economic, but also economic, of course, to a great extent, uh, in the EU, because I will be discussing about this in a bit more details uh, later on, uh, because the uh, the uh, one of the reasons for the euro, for the financial crisis in the eurozone, 2010, 18, or 16, let's say, uh, one of the reasons was, and this is enough evidence, is enough analysis uh, by different scholars, not even not scholars, but uh, by different uh, um, analysts, uh, journalists, uh, whatever you want, there's enough evidence that the euro does not fulfill, or, or, or one of the reasons for the financial crisis was the, the uh, problematic, at least if not deficient, let's say, problematic architecture of the euro, of the common currency in the EU. Now, regarding this theory, uh, you can have a look, please. It starts on slide 38 and goes down to slide, uh, to slide uh, 52. 52. So, you know, in, this, in the last... In the last slide, 52, you see there, is Europe an optimum currency area? And of course, Europe is not an optimum currency area. And you can see the reasons why. Okay? But this is not something to be discussed in this course. This is a preparation, uh, or I would like to make you aware about what will be taught within this course in Düsseldorf. Okay? But you have at least now, you have both this information on my slides here in this presentation short information about the theory of uh, of optimum currency area and you have additionally also the slides uh, as i told you the slides of, of the authors of the main book course book in Düsseldorf. okay so um but you have to keep in mind and this is very important but according, and we will get back to that if it is about uh, during the discussion about the financial crisis, which actually just follows uh, on slide 40, uh, 54. Um, you will keep in mind that according to this theory, the euro was never in the position, uh, 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 neither before uh, was launched, nor after uh, it came into power, so to say, uh, was never in the position to fulfill this criteria. It was for the, from the very beginning, and this was obvious to everybody, also to, to you politicians, that the euro, the, the architecture of the euro is problematic. Well, um, now I inserted one more element in this presentation, namely solidarity in practice on slide 53. Okay, we shift now to slide 53. Um, solidarity in practice, okay, the EU cohesion policy. Uh, this slide, on, the, on that slide, you have some more information about the second biggest part of the budget, namely the structural funds. You remember yesterday, right? Agriculture, the first one, second one, structural funds, money to be spent, in other words, money to be spent um, for different development uh, projects across the EU. And you have now more information here. And this is actually solidarity in practice. 
within the EU. This is solidarity in practice, definitely. There is solidarity in the EU, for God's uh, sake, even, uh, I mean, still today, uh, institutionalized, by the way, solidarity, in terms of structural funds to be, uh, to be, uh, in uh, structural funds uh, to be used in order to improve structures within the EU uh, in different states in need, in need of additional financial means to realize um, important projects. Okay, so this is solidarity in practice. The EU cohesion policy. I have to, you know, to add this, uh, this slide because it is a very important point. Because during the crisis and after the crisis, especially during the crisis, which now follows on slide 54, during the crisis, there was a lot of criticism that solidarity is lacking a lot within the EU. It holds true, it holds true during the crisis. Um, we will be discussing later on the uh, first uh, interest of the lenders, of the one who borrowed money to the countries under debt problems, was not, of course, to help them at first place. Uh, it was, as I told you, already told you, actually, the first, at first place, the, the first consideration by them, by the lenders, by the borrowers of money to that countries in the south of Europe, the first consideration was, of course, to secure that they own banks and they, their own uh, uh, money lenders who won't get bankrupt through the crisis at first place. Okay, so. Solidarity was lacking. They didn't provide money because they wanted to save, to save Greece and, and Portugal. They provided money in the first place, at the time at least, because they wanted to save their banks of uh, getting uh, bankrupt. Well, now, uh, this is the, the, the last um, uh, 10 slides. We have 10 slides here. Perhaps I... Uh, I will close this presentation today, so we will have a last uh, session finally tomorrow. Okay, we will need some more time than one hour, but uh, this is not a problem, I guess. Well, now, regarding the financial crisis, wh and what the EU did, most importantly, what the EU did because of the financial crisis, in order to solve the, to solve the crisis, not only to solve the crisis as such, but also to establish structures that will that will definitely help if there is again a crisis, okay, this is the, uh, the most important aspect. To avoid, to, to solve the crisis on the one hand, but also to secure that if one more comes in the future, one more crisis, we are in the position to better face this crisis in the future. Very important point. Now, on uh, slide 55, uh, financial crisis and what the, the EU did. The fiscal side, we have fiscal side, macroeconomic side, growth side, institutional side, okay? Uh, so, fiscal side, first of all, let me please, first of all, very, very shortly describe how it came to this crisis. Already discussed, actually, during the last session, yesterday and two days ago, uh, on the basis of the, um, on the, um, I mean, we have been discussing about the global financial crisis starting in the U.S. in 2008 and how this affected, finally, Europe in terms of uh, countries, member states of the EU in uh, high debt problems, Greece especially. We have, been, we have we discussed this, right? There's no need to discuss it again. But I would like to add the following regarding this uh, overall frame discussion about the financial crisis. As I told you before, just mm, five minutes ago, um, one of the factors that led to this crisis was definitely the uh, problematic architecture of the euro as such, as a common currency. Again, there's enough evidence according to the, um, according to the theory on um, the optimum currency area that the euro is problematic, okay, as a common currency. No question about this, no, no discussion about this. Now, in my eyes, one of the best books I read, you know, I follow the situation, I follow developments, 
step by step, very closely, every day. There was time between 2010 and 15, I was, re I was following the developments day by day, believe me, day by day. Um, I read a lot of things, articles, uh, analysis, um, in journals, books, etc. In my eyes, the best book I ever read, and this is included in your materials, you will find your materials. The best book I ever read was by a Greek guy uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the name of him is uh, Jason Manolopoulos. That wrote a book, uh, by the way, he's not a scholar. He's a broker in the city, in London. A broker, okay? Not an, not an economist, actually, uh, in real terms. A broker. Uh, a very clever broker, by the way. Because in my eyes, he really wrote the best book about the financial crisis, especially in terms of the Greek crisis, okay? Which was actually the, you know, it was the kernel, actually, of the crisis in the end. Uh, by, by, by arguing the following, three, three things. He pointed out three things. Actually, this book starts with the, uh, with, with the comparison between Argentina and Greece. Between Argentina and Greece. Argentina got bankrupt in 2000. And he describes exactly what is common in terms of the political system, because this is the problem, really the problem, finally. Structures of the political system, peculiarities of the political system in Greece, and made a comparison between Argentina, that, that got bankrupt in uh, 2000, with Greece, and uh, actually was able to show in a very good way, in, in, on the base of a very good analysis, that there are commonalities between the political system of uh, Argentina that led to this bankruptcy some years before the Greek one. Okay? A very good analysis. Uh, this is also a point of mine, because I also published some things about this. I published an article, unfortunately German, showing that, um, that, the, that the current crisis, because I published this article in 2014, I think, uh, I mean the crisis, by the way, uh, in other words, uh, I, I, I was able to show that the current crisis, the Greek crisis, the financial crisis, is not a crisis of, uh, of 2015, it does not go back only just some years, it goes back to the 19th century. I started to explain the political system, the Greek political system, uh, right away after the Greek uh, uh, independent state was established in 1832. This is the point where I started, even a bit earlier. So you have to understand how the political system works, what are the uh, basic structures of this political system in order to understand the current crisis. And the, the main element of this political system, of course, is uh, because we have been speaking about corruption a lot, right? But with which, which type of corruption, of corruption? Why corruption? In which terms? And it is very easy to, I mean, it is easily said, the, polit the, the political system was based on the uh, so-called system of clientelism. Clientelism, okay? This is actually what I tried to, to, to make clear, to analyze clientelism, how clientelism worked within the frame of the political system in Greece and why this finally led to the crisis 2010. By the way, this was not the only bankruptcy in Greece. The, uh, the first bankruptcy already happened in 1896, 1896, in the end of the 19th century. By the way, 1896 is the year in which my, uh, there's a comment, in Greece, I mean, I speak about Greece. Uh, 1896 was the year in which my grandmother was born, uh, died in uh, 1997, aged 101. Um, so, 18, so this is not a, a new phenomenon, and this is based not always on, on clientelism, on, let's say, political corruption always, but uh, this was actually until 2010. There have been three different bankruptcies in Greece because of different reasons, of course, not only because of you know clientelism, but in order to understand better what happens after the uh, the, um, the the political the democratic political system in Greece was restored was restored in 19 
74, you have to understand better the political system in terms of clientelism from the 19th century to the 20th century, and then, of course, uh, in um, after early 2000. Well, um, so this is what, what this, this guy, uh, Jason Manolopoulos, did in his book, and he tried to explain the crisis. And this actually, actually, this is why, in my eyes, this is the most uh, convincing argument by him. Not everybody was from that I have read in 10 years. Not everybody was in the position to explain the crisis because this guy, Jason Manolopoulos, knew very well what is the political system in Greece. The other an analysis didn't have any idea about Greece and how the political system works. And this is why he was in the position to better explain. This is why he concentrated on three factors that led to the crisis. The first one, again, was the political system in the country as such. The Greek political system, already discussed right now, okay? The second one, the second one, the second factor that led to the crisis, according to Jason Manolopoulos, was, again, the, uh, the deficient architecture of the euro as such. On the basis, again, of, because he uses, he uses in order to explain this, and you, by the way, you will find his book, if it's about the optimum currency area, the theory of the optimum currency area, you will find his book much more details. Very, very good, simple, simple explanations and lists about this criteria, this theory, okay? Get back to his book if it's about this. So the second factor that he explains that led to the uh, crisis was the, um, the, 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 uh, the problematic architecture of the euro. And finally... And this was something that was not that discussed, was my, my, my impression at the time. And he discusses a lot about this, because this is actually his job. He's a broker, right? And he asks, very simply asks, who, who borrowed this small economy, Greek economy, uh, $500 billion? Who borrowed that money to this country, to this small economy? Of course, the international financial markets, the investment capital. So he defines the investment capital as the third sector, the global investment capital as the third sector that uh, contributed to that crisis. By asking this simple question, who was that? Who was that that borrowed that country? So much money. Okay. Uh, I explained already that before the crisis, you know, the, you remember the golden, the golden uh, era of liquidity, 2000, 2008. And during the, the, this, this era of uh, high liquidity, and this is actually the period about which he also speaks in the book. During that period, uh, the, the financial markets, the investment capital, borrowed all that money to that country. Okay. So this is actually a very short discussion about the crisis and how the, the crisis came about, how the crisis came about and what have been the real reasons and factors be, uh, behind the crisis. Again, three basic uh, factors, uh, reasons, the, uh, the political system in the country, because now we concentrate, of course, only on Greece. But, you know, because, again, what is the difference with Greece during the financial crisis is that it has to do with the overall uh, uh, state debt. Okay, high debt. In the other countries, it has less to do with that, but much more with the with the bank, with the, with the bank uh, uh, system in the country, especially in Ireland. There was a danger of the of, of of the bank system to be to be collapsed. This was the reason, mostly the reason in other countries, but not in Greece. In Greece, at first place, it was high debt the reason of the crisis. Okay, this is why I now concentrate more on Greece and less on the other countries. Because, uh, by the way, I mean, to be honest, I also have more experience about Greece and not about um, Portugal, let's say, okay? So this is why I can, you know, reconstruct better, also by reading this book by Jason Manolopoulos, reconstruct better what are the real re reasons behind the Greek crisis, at least, okay? Well, now, the, our last point, and we will close with that, I think in 15 minutes, uh, we will close this presentation, uh, is about... Uh, what the EU did, what the EU did 
uh, during the crisis, especially after the crisis, in order to stabilize, stabilize the monetary union and stabilize, of course, economy within the EU, finally. Um, and you will see all this information, you have all this information on slides, 55 to, to, to 64, okay, to 64. Well, uh, um, now, I will summarize now, uh, uh, slide 55, I will summarize. Um, Well, the first thing that was done was to strengthen, of course, the failed stability and growth pact. This was strengthened uh, finally in May 2013. Okay, okay. But there is, after all, after these slides, uh, what was done in the fiscal on the fiscal side was what was done on the macroeconomic side in order to overcome the crisis and so on and so forth. Finally, you have a catalog, a catalog, a list in the end what was really done in terms of new institutions that have been launched in order to better face the crisis and better face future crises in the EU, financial crisis in the EU. So uh, now uh, this, this is the most important thing, thing in the fiscal side, better monitoring uh, on the basis of a more effective stability and growth pact as of May 2013. On slide 20, uh, 56, excuse me, 56, on the macroeconomic side, uh, a new framework for the sur surveillance and timely correction of macroeconomic imbalances. Now we have a more effective system in terms of uh, surveillance and correction of, uh, of wrong developments in terms of uh, uh, macroeconomic developments in the uh, uh, monetary union in order to, you know, to avoid bubbles and, you know, um, and we have, of course, some indicators to do that. You see all this information in the second paragraph on that slide. What are the uh, indicators that tell us what is going on within the national economy? Namely, um, and, 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 that, and then in the end creates macroeconomic imbalances that have to be have to be faced, namely trade, international investment, labor costs, private, public, and public debt, house prices, unemployment, and so on and so forth. We have different uh, indicators to be analyzed in order to understand what is going on in, in a, at the microeconomic level within every country that participates in the monetary union. On slide 57, uh, there is uh, an additional side that has to do with growth. Okay. Okay. Now this is a bit uh, controversial. Uh, Europe 2020 was not actually realized to that extent. Now uh, we are, uh, by the way, already discussed. Now by the uh, coronavirus crisis, we again face uh, uh, growth problems in uh, all over the EU as a whole, but also national economies. So the Europe 2020 plan to boost growth uh someone asked something because i didn't have time to see the comment or the question was the uh us cuts rates to zero so far? yes yes um the, uh, they reduced the uh, interest the interest to zero in order to uh the 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 uh, uh no, no, I mean now, I mean now, because of the coronavirus, the uh, Federal Reserve announced uh, yesterday, or today, I think, that they will reduce the interest to zero in order to to boost the economy. I mean, you know, to, 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 to pump more money into the market. Yes, support, uh, support investment, very simply. Well, and the institutional side, uh, what was done institutionally. Um, you have more information on that slide, but this is not, not, not now, uh, you know, the most important thing in my eyes is what follows on, on uh, slide 58. Let's go to, to slide 58. This is the most, this is what you have to learn actually. Okay, in simple terms. The key elements 
of the new governance framework within the uh, monetary union. This is a very, very important chapter, guys. And this will be a question either in the in the uh, in one of the assignments, either in the homeworks or in the final exam about this issue. The key elements of the new governance framework in uh, in the monetary union. So, first of all, there's a new institution which is called the European Semester. And, and you will understand what this uh, semester is if you go down to the key stages of the European semester. In January, the Commission issues its annual growth survey, which sets out EU priorities for the coming year to boost growth and job creation. In March, EU heads of state and government issue EU guidance for national policies on the basis of the annual growth survey. In April, Member States submit their plans for sound public finances and reforms and measures to make progress towards smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. In June, the Commission assesses these programs and provides country specific recommendations as appropriate. The Council discusses the European Council endorses the recommendations. Finally, end of June or in early July, the Council formally adopts the country-specific recommendations. But this is not all. You have to go down now to 59. The annual, the annual growth survey, you see there some more uh, information what actually this uh, survey is about that is published again in January at the European Commission. What is very important is point three, stricter monitoring of public debt levels. Guys, as it is now the case since now 2015, all member states of the Monetary Union, they have to uh, submit the, the household, the household for the next year to the Commission and only if the Commission accepts now the household by all member states of the Monetary Union, this household is uh, can, can come into power. Well, I mean, there's no, there couldn't be stricter monitoring than that, right? So these are the new rules, very, very strict rules. Uh, now, uh, this is continued on slide 60 regarding macroeconomic surveillance, okay? And finally, macroeconomic surveillance we have, we have already discussed. Um, and finally, stricter enforcement. This is very, very important. One of the reasons that the um, stability pact failed was not only um, uh, not existing monitoring, but also no existing enforcement, punishment. And this changed now a lot. We, are, we, we, we launched now financial sanctions in the case that states do not obey to the uh, guidelines of the Commission. Okay? Well, um, now on slides 61, on slide 61, there is, uh, again, if you go please down, 61, Uh, there is a summary about the, I mean, the, the title is the, the crisis exposed several shortcomings in the EU system of economic governance. This is a summary of what already actually we have already discussed. Okay, in terms of uh, too much focus on deficits, lack of surveillance, uh, and on on avoiding macroeconomic imbalances, weak enforcement, slow decision making capacity emergency financing. So this is now a summary you have of what went wrong actually for years. Of what went wrong for years. This is the summary. Okay? You can use it for this course and for your course also in Düsseldorf regarding the financial crisis. Uh, and because of that, and because of that, and because of this of these deficits in the uh, economic governance of the monetary union of the EU, we we uh, finally established 
these mechanisms that are described on slide 62 in order now in order now and we have been discussing a bit about the european financial stability facility you remember on the uh, in the next in the last presentation now this was as you remember the first institution established in the european union in order to face the crisis in order actually in real terms to help countries suffering under high state debt like greece portugal spain etc so this was what what was done in 2010 remember may 2010 this was the first institution established i told you this was actually a company uh, based on um, established on the basis of uh, british private law in order to you know to circumvent the treaties somehow and to find immediate immediate uh, solutions to, to the crisis now after that one more mechanism was or this mechanism was developed actually to the european financial stabilization mechanism that provided financial assistance to eu countries in difficulty the commission was allowed to borrow via the financial markets now not this company that was uh, let's say company that was established in 2010 but now the commission is allowed to borrow something actually unimaginable before the crisis the commission is allowed to borrow money via the financial markets on behalf of the eu on behalf of the eu under an implicit eu budget guarantee all countries together they guarantee for that money okay and finally the final now established mechanism actually as far as i know it has now perhaps uh, you know you have to check it I, I don't have the updated information but it used to have now more than one trillion one trillion euros in this available money available in this mechanism the european stability mechanism the final the final assistance mechanism under which greece was helped until 2018 2018 august 2018 it was under this mechanism that greece was helped as a final state to be helped by the eu in order to overcome the crisis it lasted until august 2018 um, that greece then um, um, was let's say released from this mechanism of course greece not yet the other countries are actually also i mean italy now is again into turbulences because of the virus huge uh, uh, turbulences uh, economic and financial ones um, so uh, any kind of crisis can back can come back again at any time at any time but now the eu at least is uh, prepared in a more pro appropriate way to face the crisis, any kind of crisis, because of this stability mechanism already established. Money is already there for states to be supported. And as I told you yesterday, uh, now the Commission uh, and the European Central Bank, they, they start to support economy uh, on the basis of different measures. They already, uh, that already in power, okay because of the uh, coronavirus crisis but this is a permanent a permanent financial assistance to help countries if they come again into difficulties financial difficulties for what reason ever okay uh, and this is again is an intergovernmental treaty under public international law this is not part of the treaty because in order to make it part of the treaty you have to amend the treaty and this is you know and this takes time 2012 it was uh, it was uh, uh, it was amid in the crisis so they had to come up with uh, quick solutions and they established the eu established this mechanism in order to uh, better solve the, uh, the crisis so this is the eu financial assistance how this developed the eu financial assistance now on slide 63 on the top of that we have since then 2015 we have an investment plan for europe and within this plan you have uh, some more information here about this plan um, i mean uh, beside the structural funds beside the structural funds 
for for every year until 2020 now this year uh, within the current budget of the EU beside this the European uh, the, the, it was a proposal by the European Commission by the way it was accepted by all states to uh, additionally spend money in order to um, to make strategic investments in different sectors of society and the economy after 2015 and this worked well by the way and Greece also received a lot of money from this additional additionally uh, from that from that strategic investment uh, launched by the uh, EU in 2015 okay uh, and finally and finally 64 this is and this is finally really I mean this is a real achievement nobody expecting the EU to be able to be ever able to establish a banking union nobody was believing it this even during the crisis that the EU will be ever in the position to launch to establish a banking union now we have a good working a reliable banking union within the EU in order to save to save banks during a, the next financial crisis that will for sure come perhaps very soon by the way uh, so we have now a framework to save banks and to save banks you know every year now by the way because of the coronavirus again crisis this is postponed we have uh, stress tests for all systemic important banks in Europe in order to see in the case of a crisis if these banks can come into turbulences and face difficulties in terms of get bankrupt we have every year now stress so-called stress tests for all banks for 100 more than 130 banks across Europe okay so you can imagine this is a huge achievement and most importantly the, the basic achievement and the most important achievement was that the, that the banks now themselves the banks themselves they have to pay money into an account every year all of them into an account specific account so that if there is a need for them to be to be to be saved that they will pay that money themselves not the citizens because you remember during the crisis 2008 9 10 but also after that the ones who paid the bill for banks to be saved had been the citizens this was done by using taxpayers money you remember the discussion we we had so now this changed a lot and this is on that very light, uh, last slide this is a real achievement unbelievable achievement uh, within the uh, within the EU okay by the way not only within the monetary union within the EU this involves all countries of the EU well this was our last slide and this is why I go now back to the uh, well we uh, union under yes exactly uh, we actually succeeded to go for one and a half hours to go uh, as it was planned actually today because guys really now I <laughs> I have to close the session because I have to decide really now what I will do in the coming three days in order to go back to Germany um, uh, because now you know I can I can now um, make online check-in for the flight on Thursday and now I can really see if the flight will take place or not uh, although you know yes of course there must be a way but you know uh, I have seen the prices and these are horrible price I mean I have perhaps to to pay